it's, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Rudolf Janisch. Um, Rudolf is one of the founding members of Whitehead Institute. He has had a truly remarkable career that um, many would aspire to, but very few would come close to equaling. Rudolf's work, and I've had the pleasure of uh, sharing a floor with uh, the fourth floor with Rudolf for 32 years. His work is recognized globally in diverse yet intertwined topics that range from stem cells to diabetes and neurodegenerative diseases. You've already heard um, mention made of his use of CRISPR-Cas9, the powerful genome editing technology. And he, Rudolph has been using that to create sophisticated uh, mouse models that better recapitulate some of the complexity of human disease. So I'll turn it over to Rudolph. OK, well, thank you very much for coming here. I'm really glad that you that you um, took the time to listen to some of the, the, the science going on at the Whitehead Institute. So I would like to talk to you a little bit about what my interest is for a long time, namely um, disease research, using various um, approaches. And I want to put this in somewhat of a historic background. What were the stages we had to solve over the last 50 years or so to do what we do now? And I have the privilege of being involved peripherally in some of those. I want to point that out. So diseases are caused by mutations in the genome. And of course, we have chromosomes. The genes are in DNA. And as we heard just from Sylvie, we have 3 billion nucleotides which compose our genome. And if there's one base pair change, let's say this one, you might be um, destined to develop Alzheimer. Maybe this one would be Parkinson, and this one might be cancer. So the issue is there are two. How can we identify mutated genes? And we heard some of these, um, uh, how we do that. And then what I'm particularly interested in, how can we manipulate the mammalian genome? And the other interest many have and I have is the question, how, how does an egg, a fertilized egg, develop to an adult organism? That's a very complicated issue. And so we have embryonic development which um, into a fetus, which goes from the fertilized egg to fetus. And then we have the adult, which is composed of adult stem cells. And the question really is, when we study those two, there are really two complementing approaches. One is the transgenic approach, and the other one is stem cell technology. And the first one was devised in the 70s, and the, sixth one, uh, the second one in the 90s. So I will really give you a few of these states. So I, like David, I'm an MD. Uh, I did not like medical school, so I uh, tried to get into experimental um, um, biology. And I joined as a postdoc um, Princeton in, the, in the 1970 um, in Arnold Levine's laboratory, which was great for me because it really taught me how to work with viruses. But I read a paper which changed my career when I was a naive postdoc in Arnie's lab. And this was from this very prominent developmental geneticist, Beatrix Mintz, who is in Philadelphia. And she made an amazing experiment, which blew me away. So she took um, embryos from a white and from a black mouse strain and aggregated those in the, petri in the test tube, and then implanted them into a foster mother and got what's, like, what's called chimeric mice. Now these mice, and I don't think, oh, he has a pointer. And these mice, um, of course, the black stripes are coming from the, um, well, is this? I don't know, this, is there? Is there a button to have a? No, maybe not. Um, oh, oh, great, this one. OK. So in the, the black stripes, of course, from the black parent, and the whites from the white parent. So these are tetraparental mice. They have four parents, two black ones and two white ones. What I found so amazing is if you could put DNA, like a virus, into these early cells, there would be in all cells. So when I read this paper, very naively, I thought, this is great. I got very excited. I called up Mintz the next day. And she was very friendly, and I talked with her. And really, she accepted me then to visit as a visiting scientist for a while, commuting between Princeton and Philadelphia. And I learned whatever I know about most genetics and most embryology in her laboratory. She's really an expert. So I did this experiment, and um, then I moved on to the, um, in my first lab at the, at the Salk Institute. And I want to outline the experiment which was started in Mintz's lab, really. 
And this was my favorite slide from this time, the Mickey Mouse slide from a, from a technician at the Wolfsburg Institute. It really outlines the approach. There are two, a male and a female. You made them, you isolate the embryos, and these will be the early mince embryos in the test tube, uh, four cell embryo, blastocyst, and the implanted embryo. And what I did was I injected and introduced virus, uh, leukemia virus, at this stage and in this stage. And I'm going to talk about these two stages later. And you put them into a foster mother, and you get mice, and then you can do all sorts of things to figure out whether the DNA was in the genome, in the liver, for example, and I want to go into this. And you can ask the question, when you succeed, would it go to the next generation? And it did. And this was really the generation of the very first transgenic mice, which transmitted foreign DNA to the next generation. And this paper was submitted by David Baltimore, who, of course, had a major role in my, in my career. And, uh, and there is David. Um, and Jack Whitehead, you saw another picture of those. And when David offered me to join the Whitehead Institute, I did this in, in 84. So in the 80s, one of the key, key issues was engineering mice, and this has been the basis for much of biology, engineering mice to understand this. And for example, viruses can generate mutations. They integrate. So the very first mutation we made was made by insertion mutagenesis was in a gene called collagen. Now, collagen is a gene which makes 70% of your dry body mass. It is a major part of bone, tendons, fascia, and so on and so forth. If, if it's mutated, it's very serious. So we mutated this, and in mice and humans, it's rather similar. So this is a very serious mutation. These are two normal pups at birth. This is one that carries this mutation. It's often called a bag of bones. So there are multiple fractures already in utero. And humans have a very similar, uh, similar phenotype. There's multiple fractures, and it's not compatible with life. So we worked on these mice to understand the disease, basically, um, for a while. But one peculiar peculiarity is here. The virus inserts random. So the virus chooses the gene you want to work on, which is a bit of a problem, right? Choose collagen from me. This changed in the 80s when Mario Capecchi invented um, homologous recombination in combination with embryonic stem cells. And this really, he got the Nobel Prize for this, has really changed biology, because now you could target genes you wanted to target. And so embryonic stem cells um, are the other part of this. And this would be an embryonic stem cell um, derived from a embryo, from a blastocyst, human or mouse. You have to digest away the outer cells, and then these inner cells, which make normally the embryo, they would be placed into a petri dish. And if things go well, they would divide, and as they do here. And then you can expose them to certain factors and induce differentiation. Induce differentiation to basically any cell type of your body, to liver cells, to muscle cells, to pancreatic cells, nerve cells. Um, and, and um, uh, uh, muscle cells, for example, there. So this is really a way for the therapy. So combining homologous recombination and embryonic stem cells, it's complicated. You can make these mutations in the cells. You insert them like alamins into a blastocyst, make a chimeric mouse, and then you convert basically a, it's very efficient, you convert a tissue culture cell into an animal. And when this was, came online in the 80s, immediately we made a lot of mice. It was the very first um, um, mutant mice this way in an immune gene. Um, and another one I want to really dwell a little bit on was a mutation made in a gene which gives rise to autism in humans. It's called the RET gene. And this is a really an amazing, um, uh, amazing disease. It hits families like a lightning bolt. It's always a new mutation. And these girls have a normal life until one year of age. And then they go in this, re in this regression phase. They lose all speech, all mental functions. They can live to adulthood. And they sit in the, and wring their hands, which Andreas Red then uh, coined the Red Syndrome. And he recognizes the syndrome. And it's really the most common mental retardation in females. Now, we made the mice for this. And the mice are remarkably similar to the human condition. I'll give you one example. If you lift a normal mouse at the tail, it spreads its paws. If you lift a red mouse, it clutches its paws, like the human. 
So we studied this and we figured out how we can help the mice, how can we slow down the disease, and we found this out, and based on this mouse work, really successful clinical trials have been started at Children's Hospital, and they have been really successful. So we can, from the mouse models, we can go to really serious human diseases and help. And we have to do better. We're really working with one to make it more efficient. But this, to me, is a very satisfying outcome. So the promise of stem cells is using the potential of ES cells to provide matched, customized cells for customized tissue repair. So in transplantation medicine, of course, is always to find a match is a problem. And what in the 90s was nuclear transplantation was really the way forward. And this was Dolly. You might remember Dolly was the first cloned mammal by nuclear transfer. And Based on this, therapeutic applications were, named, were, were devised, and this would be just making stem cells from a sexually produced embryo. When you make therapeutic tissue, it will not be matched. They're different genotypes. So the problem is you would need um, immune suppression. But if you do it with cloning, now the donor of the nucleus of the cell would be this patient. And you made an asexually produced embryo by a nuclear transfer. Then you get customized therapeutic tissue, which could be directly used for, for um, therapy. So this was therapeutic cloning. It was very controversial in the, in, in, in the 90s because you would use human eggs. And so we thought we have to make a proof of principle. Does it work actually in mammals? So we used an immune deficient mouse due to this gene mutations. Did nuclear transfer generated an embryonic stem cell, corrected by gene editing, homologous recombination, the gene differentiated those to bone marrow stem cells, put them back into the mouse, and they, uh, um, they really um, rescued the mice. The mice became normal. So the therapeutic cloning works in mammals. But if you have a human, this is not an option because of the problem of getting human eggs. So the only option was to do this in culture. And this was a birth of the IPS cell technology, the induced pluripotent stem cells by Shinya Yamanaka. And this was a breakthrough. So let me tell you a little bit about that. So one thing I want to tell you is, are these cells really pluripotent? Can they make mice? That would be really the best criteria. So I show you one experiment where we show that. So we make these IPS cells, and you inject them. Where's my cursor here? here. Um, you inject them into a blastocyst. These are the IPS cells. They go into this um, cavity. And then they contribute to the inner cell mass, to these cells, and they make this chimeric mouse, as I showed you, for mints. So the brown cells are from the IPS cell and the black from the host. And you can ask the question, can they go to the next gen generation? And they can. You made them, and there you are. So basically, what you have done, you take a cell growing in culture, manipulate it with some factors, the so-called Yamanaka factors, so you get a mouse. So I think this is really mind-blowing. And this technology has really transformed the field in 2000, from 2007 on. It's explosive growth. So the concept for human disease is rather, to study human disease is rather straightforward. You have a patient, you want to study a given cell type, be it a beta cell for diabetes or um, a neuron for Alzheimer's. You reprogram the cells by various means and you generate your desired phenotype you want to study, and you study it. You model it, and you find the therapy. So we're using this in the lab. And so my lab has a number of, 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 of um, uh, goals. We study Alzheimer's disease, aging, Niemann pick This is a storage disease, cholesterol storage disease, adrenal leukodystrophy, Lorenzo's oil disease. You might uh, remember that. It's a very lethal um, dimelanting um, disease in the brain, Parkinson's, autism, I talked about it, melanoma, and diabetes 1. And I want to talk briefly about these four. The key technology, of course, is gene editing. And homologous recombination does not work in human cells for some reason. So the key breakthrough was, and um, Sebastian really talked about this, was the CRISPR Cas, and he very nicely deduces. It has revolutionized the game medicine uh, in biology. And so this is used for disease modeling. 
And we made the first mice, actually, with this technology. Um, we could make them very efficiently. What we needed before two years, we can now make in three weeks, any mutation we want. People use it to make mutant pigs and mutant monkeys, primates, very, very exciting. It is being used in the clinic already, beginning to be used for in vivo genome editing, for um, 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 uh, remedy diseases or combined with cell therapy. It is going to the clinic. It is so efficient that the question comes up, should you do this in the human germline? Should we use this technology to change the human gene? And this has been a quite an issue of big discussion now. And actually, I just came back from a committee meeting. I'm on the National Academy of Sciences Committee to, to work out guidelines how to use this technology in humans and should we use it or not, and that's a different story. I want to use it for manipulating human ES cells and IPS cells for disease research. And I'll give you one example. That's Parkinson's. So Parkinson's, as you know, is really a devastating disease. We distinguish familiar or monogenetic one where we know the gene. They're rare, and they're 100% early onset. These are the clinically clear, but not that important. Important are, of course, the sporadic ones. That is what most people get, 90%. And they get it. It's not clear what the, it's a combination of age, combination of genetic susceptibility, environmental risk factors, um, positive family history, many, many factors work together. How do you define these factors? You define them, which it's called GVAR studies, genome-wide association studies, where people take 100,000 um, individuals, some have the disease, some not, it's sequence, 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 figure out what's the difference between someone who gets the disease and who doesn't get it. So I'll give you an example. So 90% of, of sporadic Parkinson um, are sporadic, and so each of us in the room has risk factors for the disease and protective factors, and is in, 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 exposed to different environmental factors, and we are either a patient or we are uninfected. So let's assume you have this combination of risk factors and protective factors. Then you're a patient. If another combination, then you're not a patient. So the point I'm trying to make is there are many, many genetic factors which synergize either to make the disease or to protect you against the disease. So it's a multiple of small effect size risks. They're very small effects. They have to combine. And that makes, of course, a huge experimental problem. So how do we go to this to study that? So, what, so this would be a very simple example. A patient by GVA studies has these risk genes, and the control has, let's say, protective genes in the same area. How do we study that? It's very different. They have different background. So what we do is, using CRISPR, is to exchange the different elements. So eventually, to put the risk factors into the, into the control, background and the protective one into the disease, right? So that's the idea. And we worked, so the, then we can compare really apples with apples. We try what we call make isogenic cell lines. And we worked for four years on this, and this paper actually got just published yesterday in Nature when we found got some insights into these, 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 um, these risk factors which we choose. So, the other challenges. Parkinson develops over decades. But of course, when we have IPS cells, this in vitro system, we have much less. So the question is, is it possible to study complex late onset diseases really well in such a culture dish? I mean, this is something that keeps you up at night, right? Um, so what we use, and what I showed you, is, is a in vitro culture system where we make neurons in, the, in what we call 2D systems, right? We culture these and we make then whatever in, in cell, cell type you are interested in. Of course, this doesn't reflect the in vivo situation. Cells don't live in a 2D dimension. They live in 3D. So the question is really, can you study as complex diseases as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's in such simple culture systems, or they need something better. So this is a 2D system, and now what happened the last few years came online is a 3D culture system, which is really quite amazing, where you use certain tricks to make a three-dimensional structure in the culture system. 
of, um, and this of course would allow cell-cell interactions to study and it recapitulates much of the what happens in vivo. So I want to talk briefly about this. So actually what turns out is that stem cells, adult stem cells have the, have the ability to self-organize into mini organs, starting with the gut from a Dutch group, Hans Klevers first, and then for many others, for pancreas, for liver, for lung, and for the brain, and I'm interested in the brain. So the brain, you can make these mini brains in culture from starting with human embryonic stem cells with some manipulations, and they make what we call a mini brain. I'll tell you what that is, and it's really driven by these two postdocs in my laboratory. So let me just put this in, in context. This is a mouse brain, this would be a human brain. And it's not only smaller, but also the mouse has no folds, which is so very specific, very characteristic of a human brain, these foldings, right? So why, what's the evolutionary mechanism of this? We are very interested in this, and trying to use these organoids to, to study this. So the organoids start, let's say, in one week, they grow very fast in one month, and then three months they're this, and the color says they're really mature neurons here, here they're stem cells. And when you section them, you find they have these ventricles. And the ventricles, so one month or two months, they have really layers of neurons which correspond to the layering of the human brain. It's quite remarkable to see that. So these cerebral organoids or mini brains recapitulate some aspects of human um, brain development. Let me come back to autism in broad brain size. So I told you in the red syndrome, they are smaller neurons and it's microcephalic. The heads are small of these red patients. And we can, with our therapy, we can remedy this by activating certain signaling pathways. But mutation, this particular gene, leads to the opposite, to a larger brain, macrocephaly, which is associated with autism very often. It's very serious, and I show you. Um, so I want to briefly talk about this. So this would be a patient who has a mutation in this gene and has a um, macrocephaly with, combined with really intellectual disability and autism. So we asked the question, can we model this in these, in these organoids? So this would be control organoid. It's smooth. Um, and this is now we can look with a light sheet microscope from all sides, it's smooth. And when we now knock out this mutant, which led to macrocephaly in, 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 in humans, you find these much bigger organoids, and they are folded. They look like these human brain structures. It was quite remarkable when we saw that. And we studying this, can we learn something? What's the difference between a smooth brain, like in rodents, and a primate brain, um, which is folded? But what we did in the last, actually, the last two weeks, three weeks, was to use a system for another issue. And I would just really just briefly uh, mention this. We exposed it to Zika virus. Now, Zika virus, is, of course, is, is frightening, what it does to fetal brains. And when we expose these cultures to Zika virus, it really causes microcephaly. It really shrinks these. And so we're trying to study this and figure out what cells are important for this. And what's sort of interesting, dengue virus, which is also a flabby virus, it's a lethal virus, but peripheral, doesn't infect the brain. Zika affects the brain. When we put dengue, dengue virus on this, it doesn't affect the, 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 the brain organ. So we can really study these very complex diseases, possibly in some relevant issues. But it really comes back to the question, if you want to study these, no, this is off now here, maybe. Um, um, if you want to study these long latency diseases, um, you want to study initiation, progression, manifestation of these diseases, can you do that even in organoids? That's really a question which can keep you also up at night. And so what I think we need is an in vivo approach. Can we combine what we learned, the transgenic technology and the IPS technology? Can we make human mouse chimeras? So I want to, that's my final part, I want to talk about this. So this was the, two, the 2D, the 3D culture. So what we want to do is in vivo approach. So we could think about injecting human yes cells into the blastocysts, as I showed you before. Or we could use what we call committed stem cells. That would be hematoid stem cells, neural precursors, so cells of the um, more uh, advanced, um, and try to establish them in 
in the most. So the advantage, of course, would be that you would incorporate disease-relevant human cells into an in vivo context. And you can study this over the lifetime of the animal and possibly look at therapeutic, therapeutic candidates. So I'm going to talk about this approach. So this would involve, and I'm talking about neural crest cells. I will define them in a minute, so don't worry. So neural crest cells are amazing cells. I'm interested for a long time in those. They arise at gastrulation, mid-gestation in the embryo. They migrate over long distances. And the idea was to in inject them at this early stage in utero and see whether they can establish themselves in mice. And so these neural crest cells, they're amazing. They form all the bones of your face, the thyroid, the thymus, all the adrenal gland, all pigment cells, the whole peripheral nervous system and your autonomic nervous system. I'm going to talk about the pigmentation. And of course, there are many, many diseases. This is a complex cell type, and the diseases are such as melanoma, megacolon, your colon is not innervated, it's pretty lethal, or a very mild one, cleft lip, is a neural crest disease. So my interest in neural crest came from a paper I showed you before, the old Mintz paper from 67. And she did this experiment, not to erase my interest, but to really study pigment formation in the mouse, the black stripes, neural crest. That was her goal. I didn't understand it when I read the paper. But it fascinated me. And so when I joined the Whitehead, the first experiment I did was to make neural crest chimeras. And this was involved just taking cells, neural crest cells growing from a fetal brain of the mouse, and injecting this in utero into the embryo at the time when these endogenous neural crest cells would migrate and see can they incorporate. And the result was rather stunning. Yes, I could. You can see these, all these pigmented cells are coming from the injected neural crest cells. So they could integrate and um, we could study that. But I'm not interested in the most. I'm more interested in human. So could you now use human embryonic stem cell derived neural crest cells to incorporate this into a mouse embryo and maybe study neural crest diseases in a mouse. And this is driven by these two postdocs, Cuddy Bird and Malky Cohen. So we can. We did, we used, I taught them my old technology and how I did this. And you can see here, when you inject this into the embryo in utero, now we have fluorescent labeled cells that can migrate exactly where the endogenous neural crest cells would migrate, under the skin, to pigmentation and inside to make nerves. So can you make not only embryos, but really postnatal chimeras which you can see function, they're functional really. So we made these mighty, let them get born. And now I look at the skin, I look only at pigmentation. You can see now pigment in uh, hair follicles. See this here. And I'll give you another example. This pup here has this suspicious looking pigmentation here when he grows up. These are black hairs. And, um, this one has this pigmentation here. When he grows up, he has black hairs here. So what this experiment tells us, these neural cells inserted into the embryo can function as pigment-producing cells, incorporate themselves into the developing embryo, and then function. So obviously, we would like to now put mutations into these cells which make melanoma. Can we see human melanoma growing in the mouse this way and for all the other diseases? So there are three different lineages. We're interested in neural crest, we're interested in melanoma, neurofibromatosis, cleft lip, and others. We use the same approach, neural precursors, to study Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and autism. So placing, making a mouse brain with Parkinson patient-derived neurons or uh, autism. And the final one would be endodermal precursors, which, of course, are important for the pancreas and liver. So I talked about this, and we'll talk now close with the diabetes, which is really a very um, incipient, ongoing um, program. So diabetes, as you know, is really an epidemic. And I don't have to go into this. It really goes, uh, increases dramatically all over the world. And there are really two, two major types. There's type 1, which is the minority, the juvenile diabetes, and type 2, which is the um, age from old age diabetes. It's an early onset, the late onset. Here, the insulin-producing cells uh, die, whereas here, the body has the cells, but the body doesn't respond. 
This is thought to be an autoimmune disease. The immune cells, your own immune cells, kill the beta cells, whereas this is more um, lifestyle excess body weight and diet. This is treatable with insulin. This is not. OK, so this is the pancreas. And the pancreas has two parts. The exocrine part, pancreas, which is your the, the, the digestive enzymes going to the gut, and the endocrine pancreas, which has all these hormone-producing cells, and we are interested in the beta cells, which produce insulin. So this is really the, um, the, the, the anatomy here. So diabetes is thought to be by T cells, which are immune cells, get activated by something. They're maybe by a viral infection, it's not totally clear, or by genetic uh, um, um, predisposition, and they get activated against the beta cells, and beta cells die, and then the T cells are further sensitized against products of the beta cells' insulin. So it's really, it's like a, um, um, like a um, really a cycle, which is um, um, not good cycle. And so then the disease comes when these now aggressive mature T cells now really start to kill your own beta cells. And what we want to study in the lab is really this interaction between these activated T cells and the beta cells. Now, this is so complex, you cannot study this in a culture system, not in an organoid. You have to study this in vivo, right? So that's, um, that's all our goal. So the question is, is it possible to create a mouse with beta cells and aggressive T cells derived from the same type 1 diabetes patient, right? So that's my long goal. So you would take a patient, you would make the iPS cells, you get the beta cells um, and T cells, you would then transplant them some way into the, into the animal, and you can study, maybe. that's the hope. So what do we need? So we need beta cells and T cells from the same patient. So we can have to try to get them. We have to differentiate those. We have to introduce those into the mouse at the right stage. Well, these are all tall issues. And then we want to find something which prevents these T cells to the destruction. Right, that's what be the final goal. So fortunately, in, in Boston, there's Doug Melton's lab, who's very interested in this, and they made a protocol where they can really get all the precursors of the beta cells made from embryonic stem cells in the culture dish. And they're defined by certain ways how you make those. Now, this is great. We collaborate with Doug's laboratory to now take these cells and induce them into mice. So the idea would be then to induce them into the embryos. Can they integrate? And can we study the interaction? So basically taking from the patient the iPS cells, thymus cells, making thymus cells, beta cells, and make this mouse. So how does it work? So the first experiment, very good, good postdoc in my laboratory, used these precursors from the Duck Melton lab and induced them either into the embryo or in the neonate. And what he found was that he could indeed establish cells which produced human insulin from various stages. And when he sections this, he finds mini islands, like islands. They're stained for human insulin. And actually, what's particularly interesting is these cells react. They're regulated by glucose. So this is a glucose tolerance test, which when you go into the emergency room for diabetes, that's what they do with you, right? They inject you with glucose and ask the question, do your beta cells now produce insulin? So you can see in the fasting phase, they have this level of insulin, human insulin, but if you give them glucose, it goes up. So it's, they're working. And what I find particularly useful is we have mice now which are now almost three quarters of a year old, and they still have functional beta cells, human beta cells, which produce human insulin upon in, uh, glucose stimulation. So this is the first part we're trying to make. So the roadmap would be then, after you make these mice, we introduce now human T cells from the patient. So we could make them from the IPS cells of the patient. That's difficult. Or we could maybe directly take them from the peripheral blood. And then we could hopefully test the interaction of these cells with the beta cells in vivo and then identify drugs which would help survival. Now this gets into immunology and I'm not an immunologist. So 
key for me was to get a collaborator with an immunology background. Now, being at the Whitehead Institute, there's no problem. There's a world we owned um, immunology. This Hede Ploch. Now, Hede Ploch is really into this, and he's here very proud at our Whitehead retreat in the, in the, in the White Mountains. He made this mountain, um, and he's very pleased with him. But Hede is really quite um, remarkable. So, what, so the, the experiment would be to put T cells and, anti, and, and beta cells or maybe human pancreas cells or modified antibodies in these chimeric mice and model the disease. And what they found is, it's a trick which is very recent. They used mice which get multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune disease. And they have a way to protect these mice against um, this autoimmune disease by coupling multiple spirosis specific antigens to red blood cells. I don't want to go how they do this. It's amazing. They put this into mice, and this really induces, really paralyzes the T cells which attack your neurons or the oligodendrocytes which make the disease. Um, and instead of immunity, you, get, you reverse the disease. You get immune against it. It's an amazing result. So you want to use this for the diabetes. So the idea would be to take red blood cells, couple the right antigens to them, and we would use insulin, and then have the T cells in these chimeric mice, the T cells then really attacking the beta cells and then trying to protect them with these red blood cells. So this would be one proof of principle. So clearly, insulin, we would couple the red blood cells, as I said, and we try to induce what's called energy um, um, of the T cells to so inhibit their action. And then, of course, the final goal would be to have the mouse with beta cells from type 1 from one patient and T cells from one patient, and then really trying to make what I said. Um, so I think this is a very ambitious project, but you can do only the whitehead. And I think there are a lot of challenges. We come to the end now. The scientific challenges. Very complex embryo manipulation, demanding cell manipulation, and immunology. Now, this is demanding, but we are at the place Every, anywhere can do it, you can do it there. So I'm sort of confident we possibly can make. The other challenge, of course, a financial challenge. The problem is none of this is fundable by NIH. It is not. And the reason is it's too risky. It's a high risk, high return program, and NIH is averse to risk. Well, don't do that. And chimera work is just not acceptable anyway. They have a rule. You can't make chimeras with NIH money. Uh, it's possibly c Congress mandated. I don't know that what's behind. So this really is a, is a major issue for us. And for me to do this, actually, is really the way that is the only way to do this because there is support, financial support from whatever. And, and we not only have to, can have to rely on, on NIH funding, which, of course, would be the most important, but it's not coming through. So for this, I want to um, close and just I mentioned the people who did all this work, Yun Li and um, Yuri Muffat did all the organoids, uh, Haiting Ma did diabetes work, Katie Wirt and Malki Cohen, the um, neural um, crest, collaborated with Ploch and with Doug Melton. Thank you. Time for a couple questions. Yeah, yeah. So, um, David tells me there's time for a couple of questions. Um, a, a question on the limits and promise of computational biology. Um, could you imagine a future where these experiments could be done by a computer? And then if so, what are the barriers yeah. to being able to run those kinds of experiments? Yeah, many. I think it could help a lot. I'm an experimental biologist, and my answer would be no. <laughs> so I believe. You can't predict. You can make models, and the models might react what you find in biology, but you have to confirm it biology, and often doesn't, but then you remodel it. So I believe, so even if you, but people thought when they get the genome sequence, we now understand everything. It was no. We have a roadmap, but we don't know how it works. And I think it's again and again, the GVAS studies, you define these. It's descriptive. You define this is wrong, this might be different, but you don't know how it works. I think the experimental biologists 
the, the stuff we are doing, they have to really use it and get mechanistic insights into this. So I believe it's only partial what you can do in modeling. <laughs>